think. Okay, some apprehension, but it's mostly down to the tech. Um, a very warm welcome to you all who have gathered here this morning. It's great to have a congregation, to have real life people in front of me. And uh, but I do also want to extend a warm welcome to those of you who are joining the service at home. Now, we're hoping the live stream is working as we speak. But I think there are a lot of services on, uh, clearly, on a Sunday morning, and a lot of live streaming happens to YouTube. So uh, it may be, um, at the moment, we're not 100% sure that it's all happening. And therefore, I've got my plan B um, just recording <laughs> on my phone, just that we have something to put out, even if it has to be after the service. So. Uh, I would say as well that obviously all the tech is new, it's literally been installed this week and the team, and that's really more to those who are at home, the team uh, are just familiarizing themselves with all the new cameras, with all the new buttons. So please be patient and understanding if it doesn't all exactly um, go to plan. But it will be easier at least with people in front of me to make you feel like you're being uh, spoken to. We are very grateful for all the volunteers who have made this possible today to come back to worship here uh, in the building and we're thankful for the AV team, we're thankful for the volunteers who have stewarded you to your place this morning and also those who will be cleaning the pews etc after the service is over. Most of all we are grateful to God for being able once more after nearly six months to gather and whether here or at home, to worship him. Even though it is limited and restricted and perhaps a bit uncomfortable, and maybe we feel frustrated and sad at these restrictions and limitations, we know how important it is to worship God with one another. This is what keeps our minds focused on God and his kingdom and gives us hope and new energy for the days ahead. We're going to worship God with the words of hymn 161, Our God, O oh God, our help in ages past. Now Alex has kindly volunteered to be our soloist, so if you're in the church, sadly you won't be able to sing along. Uh, you also don't have to stand, that may or may not be a good thing. Uh, if you do want to stand, <laughs> because you have no pew cushions, then feel free to stand. Uh, if you are at home, of course, you are uh, welcome to sing along. O oh, oh God, our help in ages past. Let 
us pray. God, we come in your presence, whether gathered here in the church building or at home, virtually gathered into the one body of Christ. We come together in the name of Jesus, who said there where one or two are gathered in his name, he would be present. So trusting in your presence with us, we come to praise and worship you. We come to worship in the midst of a pandemic. We choose to praise you in an uncertain and sometimes frightening time. We come because you call us to do so. We shelter under your wings as you prepare us for the journey ahead. We confess we often find our comfort and our solace in other places, and we worship false gods that cannot offer us protection. Please forgive us for this foolishness. You are the God who frees us from slavery and from fear, who shelters us from death. And so we praise and thank you. As we hear your word read and preached, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come and touch our hearts. Equip us for the journey of life, today and for the days to come. We pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen. We have been journeying through the book of Genesis for quite a few months now. Last week we heard what was in effect the climax of Abraham's life in Genesis chapter 22. There are many more interesting people and stories in the remainder of the book of Genesis. But I have decided for this autumn season that I will follow the common lectionary and preach from the book of Exodus for the next few months. We're going to make some big jumps and we're skipping over the stories about Isaac, Jacob and Joseph. They are very good if you are, have a bit of spare time, do, do you read them yourselves. But their family, so Abraham's descendants, are now living in Egypt when we pick up the story. And today, and I was nearly going to have a, um, a rummage through the, um, what do you call it, our uh, recycling bins, uh, we're going to hear about a strange meal eating in um, a hurry. Now, we've had a few hurried meals this week, uh, not really anyone's fault other than my lack of planning and trying to cram too many things in, but we actually, and this is a bit uh, embarrassing, we had three takeaways this, meal, this week. <laughs> we had McDonald's on Sunday, Domino's on Tuesday, and Taco Bell on Wednesday. Now, before anyone calls social services, this is really not <laughs> the norm um, in our house. Sometimes when you're in a hurry and you've got to go somewhere, you've got something else to do after dinner, you know, you might want something quick. And this week that kind of uh, worked out. We did have salad along with all of this. As well. Now, it's not exactly a takeaway, but the instructions that we will hear from Exodus 12 about the first Passover meal was a meal eaten in a hurry. Later, the Passover would be a celebration, a feast, something that people would sit down for and take their time over. But the first Passover meal was to be eaten in a hurry. And um, I've asked... Uh, Aaron to come and read for us because as some of you will know he's going to uh, commence training for ministry and he will be put in a congregational placement so he may not physically be uh, among us uh, for very more weeks. Um, so Aaron will read the reading from Exodus chapter 12 
verses 1 to 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they had to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roasted over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. His holy word and his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. I don't know what you're like reading instructions but I don't normally have an awful lot of patience to read the manual before uh, you start. I prefer to just, you know, go and try it and work it out as I go along. The um, recent months, I uh, and the rest of the COVID team have been poring over pages and pages of guidance, uh, filling in risk assessments, and thanks to Naomi for doing a lot of that, and then other checklists to make sure everything was done just so. On top of that, the guidance would change every few weeks, so it's been a moving feast. We've had to carefully work through the items uh, line by line to work out how we could prepare ourselves for safely reopening and going back to the building. I still can't say I'm a fan of reading instructions, but sometimes they are a matter of life and death. Here in Exodus 12, we come across some pretty detailed instructions how to prepare for a special night. In this case, following these instructions will be a matter of life and death. If they are not followed precisely, the eldest son in each house will be killed. Directions are given to prepare a feast. I say feast, but really it is a rather strange meal that is to be eaten uh, on the hoof, so to speak, with coats on, shoes on, bags packed for moving out. A lamb is to be set aside and slaughtered, one for each household and if a family's too small, they need to share it with their neighbors so that all the, all the meat will be eaten and nothing is left. The blood of the lamb is to be smeared on the doorposts of the house in which the families are gathered. And while they eat this strange meal, the angel of the Lord will go through the land 
of Egypt and strike all the firstborns dead. But the blood over the door will protect the people inside the home. The angel of the Lord will pass over that home and not kill the firstborn. It is a rather terrifying and surreal setting in which to celebrate a family meal. We read that the lamb is to be roasted and not boiled. That's really for speed's sake. And if you read on in the chapter, you'll read the instructions for the bread that is to be eaten alongside, which is not to be leavened or not given time to rise, but it will be a flat bread that is just made and eaten straight away. And the people who are there have to be dressed for travel while they eat it. It's like the food you scoff down when you're late setting off from home uh, in the morning. It's hardly an ideal setting in which to enjoy a meal, especially when you have to eat it like that. And yet these are the instructions from God for his people. I know many of you will acknowledge that the present conditions under which we can gather for worship are far from ideal. Having face masks on, not sitting, or not singing, sitting apart, having no pew cushions, I am going to keep the service short, or that's my intention, um, not being able to stay behind for coffee and a chat, it's not really the circumstances under which we would like to worship together. Comfort and enjoyment perhaps doesn't quite come into it. If it was a meal, we wouldn't call it a feast. And understandably, many of you who've decided to stay at home have weighed up the pros and cons, and at this time have decided it is better to join the service online, which is also a good thing because we wouldn't actually be able to seat everyone all at the same time. If the demand does increase, we will look to ways that we can uh, perhaps have an extra service or do something like that. Anyway, my point is that these instructions for this strange Passover meal in the midst of a dreadful night, they have some parallels with the situation that we find ourselves in. We gather in one way or another here or at home amidst danger and restrictions. We worship God amidst uncertainty, risk, and fear. How we gather here or at home is far from ideal. It's not perhaps how we'd want to gather, but we do worship God, and we do it together. Whether that means booking to come here, wearing a face mask, and so on, or whether that means sitting down at half past ten at home, making a point of joining the live stream, which, fingers crossed, is working, uh, we decide to keep worshipping God. That is so important, that we choose to keep worshipping God no matter what the circumstances. That's the first parallel, really, to draw with the passage we've read. We choose to worship God no matter what the circumstances. Secondly, like the people who celebrated the past, the first Passover meal, we get ready to leave familiar places and we go on a journey. Now, we prepare to leave behind what is secure and what we knew and what we liked, and we follow God through the wilderness be quite honest, nobody really knows yet what the next season uh, in this church year looks like. Normally at this point in the year, I have my diary, you know, reasonably filled with some fixtures for the normal kind of services that we will have in the autumn, like communion, harvest, uh, Remembrance Sunday, and then the start of Advent. You sort of know what each of these services will look like. And organizations would be back up and running, the guild would have started meeting, the BB, the guides, you know, all the building would be in full use. And as it stands, there are still lots of question marks uh, over all of these things, and most uh, or some of these things will just not be happening this season. We don't know when these things can safely restart, and we have to 
really live week by week to see what can happen and what can't. So we're in unfamiliar territory and that's unsettling. But we're having to trust God and prepare for a journey into the unknown, like the Hebrew people. They had to get ready to leave Egypt, which was the place of their slavery, not a good place to be, but at least it was familiar. And we'll find as they are on their journey that quite often they actually want to go back to Egypt because they struggle with the uncertainty and the dependence on God that they experience uh, in the wilderness. But God wants us out. God wants to move us to the promised land. So that was the second parallel. We have to ready ourselves for a journey into the unknown. The third parallel with the Passover story that I see is that in the midst of fear and danger, of death wading around, we shelter with God. The instruction to smear blood on the doorposts perhaps seems the weirdest thing to us. Did the angel of the Lord not know where the Hebrew people live and just, he could have just skipped over their houses? Why did they need to put something on their doorposts so that the angel of the Lord would pass over and not kill their firstborns? Well, presumably, yes, God would know where they lived. But God wanted the people to actively entrust themselves to him, to demonstrate that they were trusting him for protection, and therefore to demonstrate their faith and their trust and their obedience, they had to follow these instructions and smear the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. They had to put their trust in God, and it would be visible to all around that that's what they were doing. They would shelter with God. What about you and me? Are we full of fear and anxiety at this time? It is not strange if we are, but we are invited to entrust our lives to God. Yes, we need to be sensible, and yes, we need to follow the guidance and the instructions in order to keep safe and to keep other people safe. But ultimately, our life is in God's hands. We don't know what will happen to us health-wise in the weeks or months to come. Nobody knows. We may get COVID or we may get sick with something else. We all grow older and we're all mortal. Are we scared for death or do we shelter with God? Who do we trust with our lives? The Passover lamb was seen by the writers of the Gospels in the New Testament as an image of Jesus. They would call Jesus the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. And in the way they tell of the last Passover meal that Jesus had with his disciples, they make clear that Jesus himself was the Passover lamb. Jesus was the perfect and final sacrifice, the Passover lamb that would achieve forgiveness for us and that offers protection from the curse of death and sin. You may know some gospel songs that talk about the power of the blood of Jesus. That may seem a bit of a weird image to us, to consider ourselves protected by the blood of Jesus. But what those images mean is that we do not fear death or God's judgment. Jesus has paid the price of sin for us. He has achieved our liberation, forgiveness, and he died so that we may live. Do you trust that for your life? It doesn't mean, of course, that you will never get ill. It means that even in death, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Metaphorically speaking, you are invited in the midst of this pandemic to smear the blood of Jesus over the doorposts of your home. 
trust in Jesus in life and death. Shelter with God. So at this uncertain and fear-filled time, 